You know, I want to call this Jesus was a wimp. Just for those people out there that seem to have this attitude, this assertion, this belief that God, the Son of God, came as a suffering servant, as the Son of Man, acquainted with grief, and he came and he was, though a man of sorrow, somehow was macho man, that he was the Western idea of some kind of person who was like rough and tough and didn't take no guff. You know, that somehow he was like going to slash and crash and dash everybody, you know, to pieces, you know, and that he's coming back as a king and he's going to, you know, come back as a bodybuilder, you know, that's been on steroids. No. When Jesus comes back, all he has to do is say peace and everything falls apart. Because, you know, literally our atoms don't make much sense staying together, so when it all disappears and dissipates with a fervent heat, it's because they weren't holding together. It says he holds all things together by his own will. He does it, not we do it. So, <coughs> all he would have to do is just think about it and we'd all fly apart. But the point being is, when he gave us the Sermon on the Mount, he was honoring the poor in spirit, not the guys that are like spiritual giants that are out there, you know, like Mr. Macho. No, you're supposed to become humble. It's supposed to bring you down. You know, there's this whole false concept about somehow, you know, God is some kind of like, you know, bodybuilder that he's going to make you into some kind of image of who you want to be you know, by giving you these spiritual exercises that you get to now suddenly be a king, you know, and rule and reign and stomp on people and act like in your name you get to do all these things. I don't think so. You see, Tozer, because we're learning from Tozer using this as our, our guide, that he saw what was coming in the 20th, 20th century, 21st century Christians, and he said, look, you're getting it backwards. You evangelicals are going the opposite extreme. You're acting as though you're in charge rather than God trying to bring you down to the level where he wants you to be. Quit puffing yourselves up. Quit elevating yourselves greater than you are. Quit making yourselves out to be something you're not. Because you see, Jesus tried to keep telling his disciples over and over again, it's not about who's in front or who's in the lead. It's about if you're serving others. If you're helping and loving one another if you are submitting yourself, not asserting yourself. So you see, this whole idea of the macho, mega, American male, you know, ego, is the antipathous of what Jesus is. It's not Jesus. That's just some kind of Christianity in action that says, hey, we want to put our religion stamp on top of who we want to be. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. Your goal has always been one, and that's what Jesus said, was that you were meant to be likened unto the Son of God, unto the Son of Man. And the way he described that was simply saying to all of us that, quite frankly, it's called the Sermon on the Mount for a very simple reason. It's what we're supposed to be, the attitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You need to be poor in spirit to be blessed. You're not. Get there. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn. You know, there's reasons to mourn. I can think of plenty. I remember what I just blew the other day. What I blew today. What I'm still kind of feeling kind of blah about. Like, you know what? You messed up. Mourn about it. It's not mourning like, you know, oh, oh I'm so sorry that I'm not, you know, number one in the company. Don't be number one. Matter of fact, I know someone right now who's been so abused and used and confused that, you know, she finally just got blessed by the Lord, you know, and she doesn't even understand that God blessed her. You know, just somebody we've been praying for for a long time, and God finally, you know, moved her, you know, closer to us, and we've been sharing with her and talking to her, and, you know, she's kind of kind of neat, you know, because she's a very caring person, and people abuse her miserably. She's the poor in spirit. She's very humble and meek. She's... Well, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You want to be here in the kingdom, you get meek. Because you see, whatever you were, and whatever you think you are, being bigger, you better nail that sucker to the cross, because if you're hanging out as though you're somebody, dude, important, and you're out there, you know, running your ministry, and running your life, and running your mouth, and running your attitude, and running your pride, you're going to wind up crashing and burning, because 
frankly, <coughs> God loves you and He's not going to leave you in that miserable state of pride that you're in. It's not about becoming bigger. It's becoming smaller. Hello? Decline yourself. Humble yourself. And He shall lift you up. But humble yourself before the Lord. He doesn't lift you up in the sense of making you into somebody special. You already are. But He wants you to be what? Denying yourself. Because you see, anything of you is going out the window. Anything of Him is coming inside. So once He's inside, He's going to bring it outside. So you need to get left somewhere on the wayside because otherwise you're going to wind up outside. And you don't want to be that. So the way that we accomplish that is we do look at those things, you know, and we say, hey, you know, Am I meek? Heck no! I need some help! Am I poor in spirit? Heck no! I need some help! Am I mourning? Heck no! I need some help! Do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? Heck yeah! I want to go out and beat the snot out of somebody! That's not what he had in mind. I'm sorry. Merciful? Blessed are the merciful? Wait a minute, I don't think I'm quite that merciful, you know. Are you pure in heart? Well, I want to be, you know, I want to make it purely only us, you know. No, that's not what he meant. You know, pure in heart, you know better. Come on, let's be real. Peacemaker? Whoops. He said peacemaker? Wait a minute. I'm a peacemaker. I have a gun, you know, and so I'll make them, you know, be at peace. No, that's not what a peacemaker does. Sorry. Persecuted for righteousness sake? Yeah, I got that one down. I've been doing that all along, you know, making everybody hate me because, you know, I'm doing it for righteousness sake. That's not what he had in mind. So you see, it would be easy to just ignore the Sermon on the Mount and try to pretend that, you know, your assertions of your personality developing into this mega pastor or mega ministry or mega anything is right, except for it's wrong. <laughs> Sorry, you should be called those things if God is at work in you. God should be bringing those forward as graces in your life, as something that people will begin to see being worked in you. Because that's your goal. Not, I got a PhD, a PhD, and a master's, you know. And by the way, you know what? I am in charge, you know. I mean, there's some people that are in ministry that are mega ministers. Last thing I'm going to call them is meek, you know, much less humble or poor in spirit. Uh-uh. <laughs> Man, I mean, come on now, let's get real. There's quite a few ministers and ministries that you can't come close to touching what Jesus said. So, what we need to do is to not look at them, but to examine ourselves. Jesus made an interesting statement about the end of the world. And it challenges us to look again at what he said, because... He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And a lot of people like to use that to beat other you know, ministries up, beat other pastors up, beat other churches up, and say, well, we're the righteous ones and you're not, or we do this and you don't do that, or we this and we that. No. The faith he was talking about was the ones that would lay down their lives for each other. Because, you see, it's easy to lay down your life for a friend, but it's hard to lay down your life for an enemy. So, kind of like, you know, when I see all these ministries fighting each other, I ask them, well, which one of you are going to lay down your life for each other? Well, he's not part of us, so, you know, we, we don't have to do that scripture. Really? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, who served believes in should not perish, but everlasting life. If God gave his Son, will he not also likewise use you in the same capacity to lay down your life for those that don't like you or love you? <laughs> no? Really? It's good enough for the sun, but it's not good enough for you. Okay. Call me crazy. Now, I said to myself, you know, that, um, and I posted on the internet one time that I'd gone through the whole gamut of, you know, all these different ministries and ministers and seen their teachings and, you know, worked with them or gone to research them or study them or worked with them or somehow been a part of different things that I thought was really, you know, kind of like cutting edge or important or whatever they may have been. And I found they didn't really live what Jesus said. Not 
that they didn't do what we would normally call as Christian or Christian minister wise. They were very good at their religious life. They were very good at their relationship with God. But I didn't catch any of the humility part or the poor in spirit part, you know. And I kept saying to myself, Lord, you know, I really don't want to be involved with that. You know, I just don't like that. You know, I said, maybe I could go help for a while and then, you know, you can move me on to what I need to do, you know. And I would do that, you know, and I'd minister here, minister there, you know, it was kind of neat, you know, it was kind of like a blessing. But only in rare occasions, one or two times, you know, over years, would I see someone out and go, oh, man, they seem to be on the right path, you know. You know, they, they get it. You know, they get it. Now, they weren't really like someone I'd go, but I want to follow them because I'd be going, they get it, but I don't think they got it all. You know, I mean, I said, I've been arguing this in my mind for 10 years, and they've just been out grasping it. You know, I've been going, Lord, I think you want, you know, what is the truth here? Because I can't be the only one, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, just recently, just a couple years ago, or maybe it was a year ago, or maybe it was six months ago, that I ran into Francis Chan's thing, you know, and I was reading, you know, kind of passed on the internet, and suddenly I clicked on this guy's video, and it was like erasing hell, and I don't know if it was erasing hell, but he was talking about hell. It was some, you know, little video, and he was just talking. And I went, and I started grinning. <laughs> I couldn't quit grinning. And I was grinning from ear to ear. I was loving it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, man, I don't know what the message was, but the spirit, the communicative part of his soul to sharing it across, you know, the medium. And I was there. I mean, I know, because... That's just the way I feel inside, you know. It's like, wow, this guy gets it. You know, he he's he's not pride proudful. You know, he he even goes out of his way in other videos that I've seen to talk about how you really need to be doing a lot of stuff that people can't see, you know. And kind of like, you know, get out from the limelight. You know, get on with helping others to do their thing. And you know, I mean, just on and on and on. I mean, there's so much stuff that I just like, you know, I was like. I just loved it. I thought, oh man, I'd love to just trip out with the guy for a while, you know, just rap and feel better about, you know, wow, out of 35 years of ministry, I finally see somebody that I can say, you know, he got it. Praise the Lord. He got it and he went with it and he's running with it, you know. And there are other people, you know, I know that, you know, some of them are really cool in some ways, but, and they always have a part of something, but I really like that aspect of that, that Bible teacher that, you know, is now you know, gone off into his, what God is doing with him, that really amazes me. You know, other people amaze me in how they deal with it. You know, like Rick Warren. I mean, some people think he's full of pride or something else, you know, or like he's some kind of off tangent or something. And I'm like, not to the person I see, you know, I mean, maybe you see something different. Okay, you know, but boy. And I see a man that, you know, like, wow, there's a tender spirit there, you know. Now, there are other things that I probably wouldn't do, you know, only because that's not me. But what I do, you know, is I have to wrestle my own flesh, you know, and bring it to a place of, like, beat it down, man. Because, you know, people think I'm full of pride. Well, that's not the issue that I'm fighting in myself. The issue I'm fighting in yourself, myself usually is something completely different. But that's okay if people think so, you know, it's fine. But Tozer, in writing to us today, is speaking and addressing some very real aspects that we need to take into consideration if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to follow him today and take to heart a teaching that can grasp us where we're at and we can look at it and say, is this me? You know, Am I full of poor in spirit or am I really proud of the fact of who I am? A selfish lust, man's desire for first place. And when the centurion saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Mark 15.39 The current mania of men and women to succeed in the world is a good thing perverted. The desire to fulfill the purpose for which we were created is, of course, a gift from God. But sin has twisted this impulse about and turned it into a selfish lust for first place and top honors. How many motivational speakers do you know? I mean, how many have you heard of? How many are telling you how to be positive? You know, networking with this person, networking with that. You know, getting rid of negative thoughts, envisioning your goal, setting out a list and criteria of things you need to get done today. 
oh, you know, changing your body type and body style so that you look and feel better about yourself, so that you are living a full life. How to complement, you know, the workers at work. How to coordinate your skill sets so that you can accomplish the purposes you want in life so that you can have all that you want in life. Sounds good. Yeah, you know. I could see that. You know, Jesus being a corporate board room member. Maybe not. I could see Jesus being a Motivational speaker? Maybe not. I can see Jesus being in the power of positive thinking. Maybe not. You know, I can remember those teachings that Jesus gave and put him into... Well, maybe I can. Kind of seems like wherever he shared what he wanted to share, people were getting pissed off. Kind of ticked off. Kind of like accepting part of what he said, but rejecting the heavier parts. Hmm. I wonder why. Or maybe is it because it was about I. Meaning that he was confronting hard issues, hard things that were hitting the people right where they needed to hear it. And they didn't want to deal with it. You see, if God isn't convicting you of areas in your life, it's not because you've arrived. It's because you quit listening. There are things in all of us that need to be crushed, crucified, gotten rid of, and out of our life. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian or how long you've been in ministry or whatever you've done. There's always, always things in your life until the day you die that you need to crucify. Literally. Because you need to get rid of it so that you can continue on this journey that God is performing in you, which is to change you from glory to glory into the image of the incorruptible Son, so that He can make you even more tender if you are. You see, if you're a man raised normal routines, I don't think you're so tender. I don't think you're so sensitive. Especially when they say that the huge shock of a movie, Courageous, was so overwhelming that people were now beginning to talk as though men were allowed to cry. And I thought, give me a break. If you don't know how to cry, you don't know where you're supposed to be. Because the reality of what Jesus did and said was he wept. He mourned with those who mourned. He cried with those who cried. He even cried when there were people not crying. He had full spectrum of emotion. And you should too. The point is, is that we have been taught a false idea of self-esteem and somehow assertiveness in America that somehow we are Americans, you know, and it's American way. And it's not about America, it's about Jesus. Jesus was a comforter. He was a person who came and confronted people and comforted them. He didn't bend, or he didn't, like they say, with the, the bended reed or the smoking flax. He didn't extinguish the smoking flax, nor did he break the bending reed that was in the wind. Things that were yielding, you know, that were just ready to, they were so sensitive that they could at any moment be crushed. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. As a matter of fact, those that were most in need came running to him. And how could they? Because you know that the child molester doesn't come to church, does he? You know that the prostitute doesn't come walking in the front door of a church building, do they? You know that the illegal aliens don't come running in and say, Oh, thank you for accepting me and welcoming me into the kingdom of God. Do they? Or do they? For you see, sometimes in our American way, We've made things so far away from what God has said that we're creating a false religion called America. And that's a tragedy because if it ever becomes American Christianity like we've been warned about, God will treat it as an abomination. When we come to Christ, we enter a different world. The New Testament introduces us to a spiritual philosophy 
infinitely higher than and altogether contrary to that which motivates the world. Don't salute me the flag and tell me I have to pledge allegiance. God said no. Bluntly, God said no. He didn't tell you to swear allegiance to the flag. He didn't tell you that you were able to. If you could swear allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, then you could swear by the throne room of Jerusalem in the temple, and you could throw and you could swear by the temple itself, and you could say the name of Jesus and swear by Jesus' name, and you could swear all you want to. But you see, Jesus said don't. He said make no oaths. He said don't swear by them. Don't do it. You may think it's not that important. God says, I look at it. It's important to me. I will hold you accountable. So America, you pledge allegiance to, or the flag, and then you lift it up over Armageddon, and you march there for war. Watch what you say. Your words will give you away. According to the teaching of Jesus, the poor in spirit are blessed. According to Jesus, the meek inherit the earth. According to Jesus, the first are last, and the last first. According to Jesus, the greatest man is the one that best serves others. And according to Jesus, the one who loses everything is the only one that will have everything at last. Have you accumulated your Harley now? You know, your retirement account? You know, your home and your rentals and your second home and your rentals and all those things, you know, when Jesus said, what? That's for you to decide. I can't answer for you what Jesus says to you. I can answer what he told me. Maybe you are meant to have all those things. Maybe. But would you be a disciple if he told you to go today? If Jesus said right now, this moment, thou, whoever you are, follow me, would you get up and go? Without clothes, without, you know, your <laughs> PDF file or PDA, without your smartphone, without whatever it is, just where you are, as you are, the way you are. Would you just get up and go? Would you follow Jesus today? I can ask that because I'm always challenging myself to be as I've always been all my life. Today, would I just get up and go, Lord? Do you want me to get up and go, Lord? Please. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I've been on a few of those. They're fun. <laughs> but would you? See, the question is, if you would, don't read those. Don't go any farther. Get real with God. Get on and say, I can't. I won't do that. There are things, God, I'll admit to you now, I will not do, but help me to be willing if you should choose to. That's what you need to. Because most people will not, especially as they accumulate things. They will not follow God. The successful man of the world will see his hoarded treasure swept away by the tempest of judgment. The righteous beggar goes to Abraham's bosom and the rich man burns in the fires of hell. The world and its ways lead you astray. Our Lord died in an apparent failure, discredited by the leaders of established religion, rejected by society and forsaken by his friends. The man who ordered him to the cross was a successful statesman who had the ambition hacked politician kissed. It took the resurrection to demonstrate how gloriously Jesus had triumphed and how tragically the governor had failed. The resurrection and judgment will demonstrate before all the world who won and who lost. We can wait. You see, if you want your boys and your toys and your man cave now, and you want to get all this little accumulated junk into your life and add it as part of your life, it may take your life. But if you don't, and you choose to be poor and poor in spirit, both, don't get lost in that. If you choose the way of poverty, as some have called it, or the way of following the Lord, where others can manipulate and do their thing, get their Harleys, get their ministry, get their giant 
books, get their book signings, get their websites, get their mega video ministries, get everything together and want to be, ooh, you're holy. Don't. Others may, but you may not. Because if you'd really rather be like Jesus, you're not going to move up in the world. Frankly, you're going to move down. So get it in your head right now where you want to be. If you decide to follow Jesus and be a disciple of His, if you decide to really make Him your Lord, it not only will cost you your possessions, it costs your life. It always has. It always will.